Okay, all the best to every team. Welcome to Hyperledger Challenge Prototype Evaluation. We have our jury panels and three of our eminent um, jury members on the call today. We have Mr. Ganesh, who is CEO and co founder of um, Fiducia AI. It's a unique blend of different technologies. You, so how can blockchain be uh, working together with AI technology and what can we achieve with, uh, with the combination, right? So it would be interesting if you can interact with him on, on these topics. And then we have Mr. Arvind. He uh, is from Ideasoft. He is an executive uh, VP at Ideasoft. So he is into blockchain space, no matter uh, what kind of problem you have, let's say. So he is into all spaces, right? So you can imagine, you can consider him to be a blockchain maestro for any of your um, uh, use case that you may have. And then we have uh, Dr. Jubilant on the call. He is head of the department at uh, St. Gates College. And um, he also participates on open source uh, within Hyperledger community. You might have seen him leading uh, some of the special interest group related activities as well. And um, we, we hope you're doing well, sirs. And welcome to all the jury members. We'll get started with uh, the teams, right? So the first team to go would be uh, Merit, media tracking platform to tackle online piracy. So if we have team members from the team, who will be Swapnil and Ramaguru? So um, please start your presentations. At eight minutes time, you will be given a notification to uh, that your time is up for the presentation. So all the best everyone. And yeah, let's get started. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. So our project is Merit. Uh, we it, this is a short form of uh, media rights tracking. I am Swapnil Khandagde. Uh, I'm a student in uh, MTech Cybersecurity, and uh, uh, my partner in this project is uh, uh, our my assistant professor, uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Ramaguru Radha Krishnan sir. So our problem statement basically deals with uh, deals with piracy and tracking any kind of pirated material that is available on the web or the dark web. Since uh, the copyright infringement has been rising uh, for a decade at an, at an enormous rate, so its protection is as important and basically where it is being infringed, where it is being used without your permission, uh, needs to be uh, we, the law enforcement and both the copyright owners or uh, IP owners need to know that. So what our solution does is, it cross all over, it's just like a, any ordinary search engine. The difference being, it collects data from the surface cell as well as the dark web. So it crosses everything and the users uh, who are actually the IP owners can set up an S3 bucket, put up the, uh, upload their files or uh, upload their files like videos or images on it. And our solution uh, downloads those files and sends it to a AWS service known as Amazon Recognition. And uh, with there, from the collected data in our, which is uh, being stored in our blockchain database, we fetch that data as well and then compare it face to face. Uh, I mean, we give it to Amazon Recognition and tell it to uh, check whether it is the same media file, it, whether it is the same image or if, the same kind of video file. So that way, uh, the chance of detection actually increase for copyright uh, for infringed materials. This is a schematic diagram of our, so this is our solution architecture. The web crawlers we'll be using are coded in PHP. And uh, the database we'll be using would be uh, basically the hyperledger of uh, a blockchain, uh, set up using uh, distributed ledger. This also occur, we also are planning to incorporate the Bloom filter. So as I mentioned earlier, the users, the IP owners, upload their files in the 
uh, S3 bucket. So we also store a hash of those media uh, of those media files. And whenever we whenever another media file is captured uh, in our uh, blockchain, we take if uh, generally most uh, so generally like social media websites, what they do is they just scrap the metadata. But if you actually go on some piracy kind of site, they don't uh, they don't bother scrapping all the metadata because. Uh, it actually requires more resources and uh, more and more and a bigger development team for that. So we can compare that hash and this hash, and this way uh, we can actually check that whether it's the same file or not. Uh, since the IP owners would be able. To find the uh, find their IP infringement by themselves. So this so if they want to complain to law enforcement about an infringement, they already have that all the data, all the material where their uh, uh, whether their IP on which website is IP are being infringed or being violated. They have all that data, and this actually fast tracks the law enforcement process and the governance process. Of the IP rights. This is our roadmap. Uh, right now, we are working on a working on a prototype. We are halfway in uh, uh, creating that uh, Amazon uh, that Amazon recognition service. And let me show you a demo of the product. Let's just share the one button. Okay, this is our login screen. Um, maybe I'm not seeing the login screen. It's... Uh, is it visible now? Not yet. We see your PPTs. So, so we are, we still, are still, still seeing person. your uh, slides. Yeah, listen, I think listen. you need to share the whole screen. Okay, I'll do that. Is it visible now? No. Okay. Yeah. But set on the screen. Just... Okay, now it's visible. Yes. This is the admin panel. Right now, we are only dealing with crawlers. So, from here, the admin can start crawlers, the website manager. That would be us, basically. We can start crawlers, check our crawler status, whether it's actually running right now or not, and stop it uh, or according to our will. The same with the deep web crawler. Uh, the same, we can start crawler, we can check whether it's running or not, or, and stop it as well. Now let me take you to the user dashboard. So this actually looks like a search engine. Uh, the whole concept is this uh, concept of the solution is basically on a search engine as well. It just lets you search for more efficiently uh, using your. Uh, it has all kinds of data, and you can specify your own, own keywords. The IP must can specify your own keywords, and everyone everything would be available here. You can filter it according what you're searching, like images, videos, or some kind of news article or document, like your research paper or something. And in order to make it sync with your S3 bucket, you can specify your S3, your can update your access key ID, secret, secret access key, and the bucket name here. So the moment you do it, automatically everything in your S3 bucket is set. It is sent to Amazon recognition and it is uh, verified and it checks uh, whether the files are uploaded already have uh, uh, have already been uh, indexed into our database or not in the blockchain database. The same, this uh, update S3 file, this uh, S3 file search button, it just it fetches the SC, it fetches all the files notes down their hash and then verifies uh, it with the other files that have been indexed in the data in the blockchain 
Uh, okay, that would be all I guess. I have one or two questions if that's okay, please. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, you can go ahead. So eight minutes is up. Yes, anyway. So uh, Hyperledger is the foundation for your solution. And uh, the problem that you're trying to solve is IP protection, right? Content fingerprint is taken. I can go inject a simple extra QR code and change the fingerprint and then upload it. I can alter an image and upload it, but still they're copying it. Do you have a view how you want to address the IP protection overall? Right, that's one. The second part, second question primarily is, can you elaborate for me and all of us on the call, uh, why blockchain for this particular solution? So that way we all start to learn, right? So it's all new, blockchain is very, very new. And we would like to learn your view, uh, why you chose uh, Hyperledger, that would be very valuable. Thank you. Uh, to compare whether the media is being infringed, uh, we, use the Amazon, we use the AWS recognition service. So any kind of media like video or image, if, uh, whichever we index into our database is sent over there, along with any S3 database, uh, any S3 uh, any file stored in the uh, S3 bucket of any user, and then we compare it. So everything is done by that recognition service. It has its own ML algorithm and it verify and it has been actually been proven that it is quite efficient in uh, detecting uh, whether a file is similar or not even if you actually crop the video or change the metadata because it is it is using machine learning and it just come it uh, suppose i upload a video file it divides it into frames takes another video there which we have indexed divides that into frames and then compares it frame by frame so there's a higher uh, so we actually get a higher chance of uh, detection uh, rather than just relying on metadata. Like most uh, websites, for example, say Facebook, someone uploads something on Facebook. They, what Facebook does is whenever you upload it, it just scraps all the metadata, it removes all the metadata from your image and inputs its own instead. But even, but in this, in our solution, even if you just scrap all the metadata, it would be of no use because we are checking it frame by frame. We are letting the ML algorithm see for itself whether it is the same image or not. Then why do you and need hatch yeah. comparison? Yeah, 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 sorry to interrupt. So one is then what is the real value in terms of doing the integrity check by comparing the hashes? That, that, that is one. And second, you know Hyperledger Fabric is a permission blockchain. So who are the stakeholders who will be maintaining the nodes, basically? Uh, the hashes are basically a preliminary check so that we don't uh, need to burden the AWS recognition server. Suppose if someone has uploaded it as, as it is, the metadata is still going to remain and the hash is going to remain the same. So it is, a it is just a preliminary check. If your file isn't found in the, in, the, uh, in the hash database, then it goes to the AWS recognition server. But just uh, for hashing, you need not go to blockchain, uh, uh, right? You can story, use any cryptographic function. So what is the intent behind blockchain? So who are the stakeholders who will be maintaining nodes? Uh, we are using blockchain to... Uh, yeah. Swapnil, can I take it, this question? Uh, yes, sir, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, the sir, the reason one to answer uh, what I think, uh, I think Hari, sir, also asked is, uh, yes, the reason why we wanted to go for blockchain Specifically, hyperledger is uh, because of the uh, the design, uh, the principles of hyperledger and the open source uh, community. That is one main reason. And secondly, the reason for going to blockchain and regarding the stakeholders is like we are uh, looking for a solution which could include multiple stakeholders, like uh, like the copyright firms, the government could be the stakeholder, and uh, there are uh, sites like, for example, if you take. Uh, journals or uh, the uh, solution providers for the media, like the media houses who normally release the music or video. So these people can be the stakeholders who can uh, 
take a node and they can be maybe in a node and they can run in so these are the possible stakeholders we are currently looking at okay so you mean all these stakeholders will uh, put this as an evidence so that all those things can be used later that is what you mean yes sir okay but okay. also like and, the, my... the question on the hash uh, this thing as uh, hari sir also asked like we are uh, looking at a bus business model also or looking at like a product productizing this idea like the main intention is yes today when we when a common man wants to do a copyright thing it is very costly like i cannot go and uh, pay for a copyright uh, uh, trackers and uh, see that if my content is infringed or not so this is going to be a solution that anyone can use like there could be different levels like we will be using some level of service like free service like whoever creates an account like user account we will be giving a free service so we can use a simple hash or something like a similarity hashing algorithm could be the hash that i used to uh, uh, detect which i will use it in bloom filter so the filter will tell whether this particular hash has been already detected or has been crawled somewhere or not so this could be some free service that i provide to a common man who quickly wants to check whether his content has been infringed or not so that similarity hashing will answer the question of what if someone slightly manipulates like he rotates the image or just add a watermark the hash is going to change so we are not going to use the traditional cryptographic algorithm but we are working on on our own um, uh, customized similarity hashing algorithm so we will be using that customized hashing algorithm so that is one part Uh, which will take care of that and for a premium kind of service at different levels we will be uh, sending it to the machine learning algorithm so looking at the business model also we thought that <laughs> it should be in different levels so that is why we are still using ash okay. and there is one high end machine learning also so, so sorry to interrupt Excuse i me? think we are yeah, over yeah. the time hmm? okay. uh, uh, okay. no mind this one important question so is the intent to Uh, open source and then continue to work with the community as you build solution or something as a question is a plan to can you repeat sir sorry the community or yes i are interest more much more interested to work and collaborate with hyper ledger community okay. thank you thank you sir thank you sir. thank you okay. very much thank you thank you thank you it's a pleasure knowing what you guys said thank you thanks for the question sir sir so we are over the time for this team 15 minutes allotted and so uh, next teams please do make sure that you are able to answer the questions in short and brief and um, let's acknowledge that we have many teams waiting on in the pipeline Uh, thanks, Team Merit. Our next team is Mosaic Decentralized Workforce. Uh, are you ready? Yes, actually. Um, let me just reshare my screen again so I can share with audio. Share sound. There we go. Oh, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> that works. Okay, so let me move this off. No. Okay, I'm going to try this one more time. Okay, I want to swap presenter and slideshow. Perfect. And I can take this away. Okay. Uh, I'm today. I'm going to present uh, Mosaic decentralized workflows as part of the Hyperledger challenge. Uh, the key members in our team are Dr. Mashatan, who is the uh, director of the Cybersecurity Research Lab that uh, we operate out of. Uh, I'm presenting today. I'm Dave McKay. I'm the technical lead at the lab, and our lead developer for this project is uh, Vladimir. So the problem statement 
So blockchains were not designed for multi-step workflow process transactions. So blockchains were uh, originally uh, for backing cryptocurrencies that just have a, a transfer step. And inter-organizational workflows involve multiple prescribed steps, roles, instances, accumulated data, and application interfaces. So if you're trying to represent real world business uh, workflows and processes, they're very sophisticated. So how can we write decentralized systems that offer enforced workflows for everybody, all the participants and all of the instances that are running? So this is a, a problem that came out of uh, building uh, decentralized systems for uh, industry. And we've realized that we had to take a step back and, and solve this problem. So our proposed solution to this is Mosaic. So Mosaic is a, a blockchain system that allows for collective development of business processes in a decentralized system. So how do we go about doing this? So what we do is a starting point is you take your uh, workflow, whether it's a governance workflow or a business uh, process workflow, you represent that as a state machine in a diagram. Uh, we take that, we encode that into a, a JSON template that has a very specific uh, format. And then we, uh, we take that and we um, then present to people in a user interface um, exactly how that'll look. And the interesting thing is you can use these workflows for the governance body can use it himself and they can modify their own governance as well as the workflows that the governance represents. What are the kind of benefits we get out of this? Well, you get consistent workflows. If, if you're trying to code workflows where it's a whole bunch of API calls, you're not guaranteed that people are gonna call these one after the other. So having a state machine gives us the consistent workflows. Um, putting the, uh, the templates uh, into data as opposed to code means there's reduced development. Uh, blockchain development is very slow and very expensive and is very collaborative. So if it's just modifying data and you have signatures on that, that's a way easier way of doing it. It's very easy to integrate with your existing systems because we're presenting back um, uh, display information without prejudice to how it's displayed. Uh, encourages participation because the uh, there's built-in system for everyone to provide governance on the system. And the way that that governance works, uh, uh, we're, we're looking at methods for making this highly equitable. What's sort of unique about our system? It's, it's data-driven. So it's data-driven and where that's useful is business workflows uh, change all the time. So let's say if it's insurance or real estate or supply chain, um, those things change. And so if you have to code those all the time, that's, um, that's a lot of work. And a lot of people have to agree to that code, all the different parties, because it's a decentralized system. Um, we integrate very easily with existing applications. So if everybody has their um, centralized application that's integrating this part, if someone changes the workflow, if they have to go in and change their code to, to match that, your system will fall apart. So it's almost like a, um, a web system where we're providing the interface or at least the what needs to be displayed on the interface. And it's a self-referential system. So we use the workflows for our governance, which um, in turn is how you change the workflows. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting concept there. So I'm gonna show, uh, I have a video and this is our demo. In this demonstration, I will show the workflow templates and the parser and renderer subsystems of the Mosaic system. In Mosaic, we start with a state machine diagram. In this case, I'll use our component test system diagram as an example. The state machine starts, and you can select different test states and return back to the starting state. The state diagram is converted to a JSON template that represents the states, actions, roles, transitions, and display objects. For this demo, we have manually built the template and we'll be putting it into a Mongo database. For the launch challenge, we'll have a visual editor and we'll use CouchDB that is part of the Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. Let's take a look at the start page of this template. This web page is a rendered version of the start state and default role of the state machine. The buttons on this page match the transition lines in the state diagram. Let's take a look at the text test state. On this page, we're in the test state where we display the different text options we have for display objects. The display objects are abstract versions of what to display with no prejudice towards how they're displayed or on what type of system. They should be able to be displayed in browsers, mobile apps, desktop applications, and even embedded system displays. This is a decentralized system. We allow the participants to connect using any interface they prefer 
and from within any application. To render a page, the user requests to start or continue with the state they are in in the workflow. The parser retrieves the data for that state from the template, and based on the role in previous inputs, it creates a set of display objects to send to the renderer. The renderer then interprets the display objects to build up the user interface. Having the interface rendered from the state data allows any application to integrate with the workflow and not to have to redevelop or recompile when a change is made to the workflow template. The render code can be enhanced to add any type of style to the basic objects. We are not sending HTML. We're not trying to force a visual representation. We want people to be able to decorate the data and controls to match their existing design choices. Here is an example of a real-world workflow for transparent bidding in a real estate transaction. This example workflow comes from our experience in attempting to build a real estate blockchain system to reduce fraud in real estate transactions. While building the system, we realized that we'd created a central web application to access the system. We were forced to do that as we did not have a way to enforce the smart contract calls to enforce the workflow order. We also had a problem with guaranteeing that people who were self-onboarding were qualified to hold the roles in the system that they claimed. All of these problems led to this work on the Mosaic project. This concludes the demonstration of Mosaic. Okay, and now I'm going to jump back to the presentation, which is here. <laughs> All right, let's swap. There we go. So, what's on our roadmap? Uh, we want to build a visual template editor because, trust me, building these templates by hand in JSON is a lot of hard work and uh, very error prone. A visual template editor will allow us to do that uh, very quickly and easily, and it'll also allow people who are involved in the business process, so actual business analysts and that, to be able to validate that the template, uh, uh, the, the workflow is correct. You don't need them to have to read programming code to do that. We're going to stick our parser into uh, chain code and Hyperledger Fabric. And we're going to move the Mongo database we have over to CouchDB uh, under Fabric. And we're going to generate our first full governance template. So thank you. That, that concludes the presentation. And I'm ready to take questions now. Yeah. Dave. Hi, Dave. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Ganesh, you can go ahead. Please. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, Dave, uh, definitely an uh, uh, a project which can really bring down a lot of hassle for developers because see even we have a product uh, called trust flow uh, for a supply chain uh, uh, cross organizational workflows and all yes this is real pain point which everyone is facing today and again we tried something like templatizing the business processes based on uh, sap's one domain uh, model and various other things but how do you bring the context into the scope, right? Into the smart contracts. So that is one uh, question for you, okay? And second thing, so are you enabling this as a platform so that people can create their own templates or what is the model you're looking at? Okay, so we actually have, um, there's three databases. One is the, the template itself. Um, another is a context one, which is going to provide the, um, the language, images, things like that. So a template can be reused by uh, different um, groups for different things. So if you had a voting template, um, that could be a common voting template, but people can change the language and things in there. And the language might not just be changing the wording, but it could be changing the actual language. Maybe you want to have an English, French, and Spanish versions of it for, for North America. Um, we also have an instance database. So the instance is every time you spin up a new uh, state machine workflow, there's an instance there. And so the instance knows the template it's using, it knows the context that it's using. And so it, uh, and then it keeps track of the data as the, you, you gather data as you go through the workflow. And all of that is brought in together and uh, rendered and sent uh, as display objects over to the, uh, the, the, whether it's a mobile application, a desktop application or a web application, that can then show the user interface. Um, so that's the approach there. This is uh, this is an open source project and it's a decentralized thing. So anybody could run this. Um, and 
Uh, anybody can create templates for it, but to get the templates accepted into the system, you have to go through the governance workflow. So you have to, we, we bootstrap people with a set of governance templates. Um, and as um, uh, organizations are onboarded into, let's say a, a channel in fabric, um, they are then uh, added to this and their voice is um, put in there because they can vote on the governance workflows. So if a template is to be changed, that's a proposal that's put into the system and uh, the proposal uh, gets voted on there's a whole debate process and the proposal gets voted on if it's uh, accepted it'll go to uh, someone to actually make the change and that change is put in people review that vote on that accept that and then immediately the template is changed and so right then and there as long as a majority of people have uh, agreed to that template change that will immediately change it across the whole system okay dave okay and uh, to what level you can make it uh, industry ready and uh, how do you think, uh, uh, what, are, what are the challenges you face uh, when you uh, the, the think you can uh, function and make it functional in the industrial level? Uh, sorry, was the last word there? Yeah, I would like to know about the challenges, how uh, when you make it industrial level, implemented in the, in the industrial level. Oh, uh, for, for industry, yeah. Okay, so uh, two things, how do we make this industry ready? So as I'm explaining, we need to have a visual editor. So that's a, a major part to it. Um, and we need to have our uh, base set of governance templates. So the governance templates is how you get started with the system. Um, so once we have that, then we're, we're ready for at least our first uh, implementations, which are going to be, it'll be a little rough. Um, how do we get this up to kind of an industrial standard, um, uh, enterprise sort of standard? Uh, that's going to take some work in how we configure this for Hyperledger Fabric. So we, we haven't built the chain code yet. That's what we'd like to do for the, uh, the next uh, challenge. And uh, that's going to enforce um, who can do what. So there's going to be different roles. Uh, eventually, our goal is to attach the Hyperledger Aries project, having verifiable credentials being used to enforce the roles. Um, until that point, then it's up to each organization um, using their um, membership services uh, to uh, track who has which roles in, in the system. Dave, uh, just a quick question. First, just to reflect on what you shared. I mean, conceptually, it's very, very relevant. And these are the applications which would start to thrive on uh, Hyperledger or any blockchain for that matter. So sincerely appreciate the thought that has gone into what we're working on. To build enterprise grade solution, oftentimes we run into performance issues, right? Blockchain is in its very nascent stage and uh, we all know transactions very soon can go drastically high. So what is philosophically, how are you looking at it? And, uh, and I'll tell our own experience, right? So, so 100, 200, 300 transactions per second, we really have to start to fine tune the systems to really make it work uh, today. That's where we are. So how do you look at it? I asked this question, this is a tough question, by the way, and nobody has a clear answer. We're all trying to figure this out. Uh, have you started thinking about it? Uh, it's more relevant for you because I, I see this as enterprise grade already. Yeah, so um, our selection of Hyperledger Fabric was for several Solutions. Um, also that it does have a high throughput. A lot of the activity with uh, Mosaic is going to be read only, but there will be writes. So for example, I was showing a form there where we write to it. Um, and so uh, to begin with, we're going to write our chain code in JavaScript, but eventually we're going to move that over to Go uh, for a higher performance. And uh, it's we're, we're at the mercy of the speed that uh, Hyperledger Fabric can uh, handle transactions. It's not really our, our capacity to be able to update the way Hyperledger Fabric works. And only uh, this is just reflecting on our own experience. So since technology is nascent, we have to be very careful in deciding which transaction goes where. That will go a long way. Yeah, a big thing for us is the types of uh, governance that we'll be covering. Um, so I do a lot of work with the Hyperledger Aries community. Um, uh, and so we need uh, governance uh, for the networks that we provide. 
And so in there, there's, there aren't a lot of participants and there's not a lot of writing. So we're not going to see the types of thousands of transactions per second on this that you would see in, let's say, if it was a supply chain for perishable goods. So it's, it's kind of the selection of the um, implementations that makes sense for the throughput that we have. Wonderful. Very eloquently explained. Thanks so much, Ted. Thank you, team. Um... Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks, Team Mosaic. Uh, our next team is reducing methane leakage and flaring with supply chain tokens. I push ready. If you are joining in now, so we are running 15 yeah. minutes delayed. Okay, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you. So, excuse me. Yeah, let me get, get started. Yeah, so this project um, was, uh, yeah, some work we've been doing on uh, the problem of reducing methane emissions in the oil and gas supply chain. Um, our project uh, consists of myself, Bertrand Ryu, uh, Seishen. Sorry, uh, are you Yuab. sharing the screen? Sorry to interrupt. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I am. Let me try okay, again. We are not able to see. Yeah. So let me try again. There we go. I think that's, that should be up. Yes, now it's visible. Yeah. Yeah, so we've we've been working on this for the past several months um, and using a technology stack that's been developed under the Hyperledger existing Hyperledger Labs project um, called blockchain carbon accounting. So it's looking at carbon accounting tools, um, yeah, to solve some of the the world's climate problems. So the specific problem we're looking at is this issue of waste emissions from the oil and gas industry. For you, for, for those of you that aren't familiar, the oil and gas industry flares um, methane which is a primary component of natural gas and also vents it directly to the atmosphere um, to the tune of more than $60 billion of potential um, uh, value as far as the value of this wasted resource. There are many reasons why they do this, but there are many reasons why they don't need to or there, there are opportunities to reduce these emissions. Um, and this represents you know, almost double what the EU imports from, from Russia cur currently um, as, uh, as natural gas, which obviously is, is an important problem for the energy security, but also up to 1.3 billion cars of emissions just from this waste in you know, like the oil and gas industry. It's just lost. So there's a need to, uh, to reduce this um, these emissions is a real economic opportunity as well. Um, now, the problem is in the past, a lot of government data has been wrong about the about the, the problem. They've been under they were underestimating the, the scale of the emissions, and industry wasn't really measuring it. There have been a lot of efforts to improve that now, and need independent uh, sources like satellite data actually looking from space at what's being emitted by the oil and gas industry. The reality is, oil and gas will remain important. Um, in uh, you know into the into the future, a lot of projections su suggest that we're going to continue using oil and gas. There are a lot of efforts to try and um, you know decarbonize, but these are essential fuels. Um, and there's a very fractured data la landscape. There are a lot of different government agencies, companies that are self-reporting, on-site site instrumentation and certification that's being done, and as I mentioned, satellite data. Um, and new efforts to, to try and certify all this data to produce like certificates um, about what the oil and gas industry is emitting, um, either you know, for regulatory purpose, like to use the stick to say, okay, industry, you need to, to reduce these amounts of emissions or to, to use a carrot and actually um, motivate companies or incentivize companies that are uh, emitting below sort of benchmark uh, values um, in the oil and gas industry. So the solution that we've been, been developing um, essentially looks at certifying these sort of waste emissions so that the data can flow across the supply chain. So we have oil producers on the far left of the screen, which would have this sort of tokenized emissions that, that, that we've developed. This is sort of contract system for tokenizing this emission data. And this information can then flow through from energy producers all the way down to the consumer. So they can have a view of what are the waste emissions in the supply chain. I'll talk a little bit about what are the sort of business cases or how one would use these types of tokens um, in the real world. 
Um, before I get into that, let me just talk about the sort of how we framed this, our initial prototype and our specific application. So what we wanted to look at was um, waste emissions from oil and gas producers in uh, some of the major production basins in the US. So Bakken, Neobrara and the Permian, these are just large oil and gas oil and gas fields. And they're supplying this gas or oil and gas to utility companies, say in Western states. And these utility companies are want to know what's the, the sort of impact, the waste produced by the, the gas that they're, they're buying. Um, now, in order to implement a system where we could, you know, set up, set up this, we, we put together this, this tech stack, but as I mentioned, as part of the broader blockchain carbon accounting project, where we use both Hyperledger fabric for managing high volumes of data flow, for example, facility or com company level data, Hyperledger Bestu network to, to implement these emission certificate contracts um, to create emission tokens and enable trading of emission data between supply chain partners. Right? Um, so looking at different, uh, um, public networks where these contracts can be deployed, um, you know, including the Binance Smart Chain and Hedera ha Hashgraph so that these token networks can then, emission token networks can operate in a public space. Um, we've also been using Hyperledger Cactus in order to facilitate the connection between say Hyperledger Fabric and um, these, these public networks. Um, the, the key elements that I'll be showing in this prototype are, are have been developed using a Hyperledger BESU implementation. Um, and we just in a development environment right now while we're deploying everything uh, in hard hat, which is an environment for, for developing. <clears throat> um, so what is our sort of competitive edge? Well, we present a solution where we can really incorporate all sources of data. You know, we're really open, we're, we're, we're agnostic to the source, but we're creating a system in which we can bring together auditors, which are essential for creating these certificates, the companies that have the data, independent data providers that can sort of verify, independently verify what companies are reporting, and then enable the certificates to be connected to the cons these consumers, right? Whether it's a gas utility company or an end consumer. We're open and transparent, and we enable the transfer certi certificates through a supply chain. Um, and before I get into the market opportunity, let me just close this. And I don't have the demo running right now on my machine, but I can just run you guys through quickly the, um, the video recording um, that we put together for our submission. So um, as I mentioned, yeah, we have this, this problem. We've created this portal for tracking, issuing these emission certificates as part of the net emission token network, right? This is this, um, uh, this Ethereum smart contract uh, um, uh, D app. Um, that we've set up. We have this tracking feature where, um, say, an auditor that's registered with this network can issue um, an emission certificate. We're here. So in this case, we just have a um, US, uh, an emission auditor that belongs, that owns this address is going to issue an emission certificate for some generic US oil and gas producer. Um, and they will upload data, for example, um, um, the amount of tons of CO2 that were emitted, for example, tons of CO2 that was flared in CO2 equivalent, the, the time frame in which the um, emissions were realized, and some descriptive factors about it, for example, location and the sort of scope, the scope data, as well as um, perhaps location information. Where was this data sourced? For this prototype, we've just gathered a bunch of data from different sources like the International Energy Agency, um, flaring model and flaring intel for a variety of different uh, regional um, oil and gas production cut producers at country level, but also these basins, for example, the US. Um, let's go back to the video quickly. So yeah, once um, these tokens are issued, I'm using this data, right, the transaction is submitted to network. Um, so we have these certificates, the others issued, and they may, want, they may need to add product information to these certificates. Right, so we have the information about total gas flare, total methane leaked into the atmosphere, and we want to know um, what are the products associated with these emissions. Now, what these products tells us is the um, how much emissions exist per unit of, of fuel, say that's traded to a consumer. Um, so here we have this emission data, and we now have uh, product data that's being added to emission certificate. For example, oil or gas. And we add some amount or some unit information. Now we finally have these certificates. 
uh, final certificate that's been issued, right? Now I've gone ahead and, and, and seeded the, the network with a bunch of emission certificates for all of these different oil and gas producers in different basins. And they've been color coded to represent, to uh, demonstrate or illustrate um, the emission factor. So this is the total um, gas flared uh, or vented by a given producer per unit of, of energy produced, either in tons of oil equivalent or thousand cubic meters. And they're compared relative to a US average oil level. So what this tells, um, they say a natural gas utility that wants to buy gas from one of these producers, you know, what are the waste emissions associated? And they may value, for example, gas from the Neobrara Basin at a premium because it has a much lower emission factor, this 60 kilograms per ton of oil or 53 for a thousand cubic meters relative to US average emissions. <clears throat> so now um, a utility company can log into this, to this network. All right, say we have an industry um, or say the natural gas company can log in and has been issued the certificate for the oil and gas it produced and it can now transfer um, products from one of its certificates. Um, let's say this is the Neobrara um, producer, can now request to transfer its products um, to- Sorry to interrupt, uh, but your time is running out. Uh, we want okay. to move on to the q &A. So can we get started with that please? Yeah, sure. We can go ahead. I'll close this out. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Um, just before we get into the Q and A, we'll just talk a little about the business application. So there are two elements to this. There's a emission verification and auto contract pool. So this is sort of being set up as a DAO um, to for the process of verifying data about that go into these emission certificates. And then there's the actual emission certificates that are issued in the marketplace that involves things like consumer commodity differentiation. So differentiating you know, one unit of fuel from another from a different basin, but also um, compliance with investor environmental sustainability governance requirements. So this is things like um, requiring an oil and gas producer to demonstrate that it's reducing its total emissions in order to access funding. So these are the type of sort of business models that we're looking at deploying um, with, this, with this solution. All right, sounds good. Uh, can we have the Judy q &A? Yeah. Uh, a good combination, but why NFTs? Um, so the reason why we deploy these emission certificates NF as NFTs is because um, they are they're not a fungible token, right? They're a specific token that represents the emissions of a particular, um, say, producer or facility. Um, we used NFT just as a, as a model. So when we were developing the, the contracts, we were using this uh, Open Zeppelin standard. So we just use the NFT standard to develop it. Now it could be implemented in any sort of contract framework, right? Sort of, you know, for- Because the unit of, yeah, yeah, see the unit of gas or whatever methane or is pretty much same across the world, right? So obviously you can take that as a unit of value. Yeah, and then- the, uh, the, the, unit, the unit for the emission certificate is actually the emission factor, which is unique to a specific facility. Um, okay. the, yeah, you're right, a product, which we represent as a token, is actually a fungible token. And the product itself can be traded not as, it's not an NFT, it's just a product that you can sell to your consumers. So this is just the combination of different token types. We represent the emission certificate itself, which embodies all of this information, information about the emissions and information about the products, which are fungible tokens, into a non-fungible token that enables us tracking of embodied emissions. Okay. So yeah, then, uh, to, that's a uh, nice presentation and I would like to know to what level uh, uh, this can be uh, industry ready just because the current runners are really strong and uh, they will be having an existing space over there and how do you think uh, your system can make uh, some impact on uh, a new scenario in the industry? Yeah, so there are a lot of existing solutions and, and new companies uh, emerging. Um, I'm currently looking at a company called Validir, that's a Canadian company that's providing cloud solutions to manage information about, you know, barrels of oil or gas for companies, and they're providing these cloud services. Um, the We're talking with them about how we can facilitate really tracking this value um, associated with the embodied emissions of a given unit of fuel across the supply chain. So that's taking it from the producer to the refinery unit down to the consumer. 
So really there's transparency of this information. And that's where we believe blockchain and these public networks can facilitate the existing solutions out there that are facilitating sort of data analysis, this big data analysis for oil and gas producers. It's really connecting that information across the supply chain. Um, so that's where we believe our solution and our sort of blockchain innovation can, can help um, some of the existing work, which is also still very, very, it's very in the early stage. Um, but is more evolved as far as industry engagement. Bertrand, uh, it's really fascinating to see at least the functional flow of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, where, where, uh, the maturity level is very, very high. I just want to reflect on that. I want to learn from you uh, applications such as what we're discussing right now uh, will be successful if you start to see engagement from the certification bodies, participation from various folks, right? It's not uh, just the two of us. Uh, it could be five different entities, including government and others as well. Can you reflect for us here on the call how you are approaching that to ensure while uh, there's a lot of technical merit to what you're actually saying, which is very visible and kudos mm -hmm. to that, how you're approaching that? Yeah, so we've been in discussion with some of the major standard setting bodies like um, Vera, right? And interestingly, Vera recently announced that it's going to halt issuing of emission credits, offsite credits, on uh, blockchain networks, all right? So this copying of the credits that they issue. Now, we, we do not deal in offsets for this prototype. We're just looking at how do we facilitate the auditing process, right, for these emission certificates. And this is essentially what a lot of these standard headed bodies are doing, right? They put together, you know, industry and auditors to create these certificates. We're trying to engage with these certification bodies to say, here are tools that you can use to facilitate that process and even bring down costs. Cost in the um, sort of, at least in the offsite credit space and also the emission certification space, which is we're looking at, can be very high. So, we're, and this is because you have a lot of different transaction costs against across different players. To solve these problems, to solve the to solve these problems and create these certificates. So we're trying to engage them to say, okay, here are tools to facilitate um, what you're trying to do. And obviously, at some point, regular regulators could get, could be involved um, in these mark in in these type of tools for facilitating sort of more um, sort of mandatory carbon markets, right? But right now, we're just looking at a sort of long. Term. Sure. No, so, I think we're running a bit out of time. Uh, I mean, I think we should all kind of be cognizant that there are a lot of teams, right? So let's try to keep the demos within eight minutes, maybe nine maximum. And uh, let's also see if we can keep the jury questions to 10 to 15 seconds max so that the teams actually get a little more time to maybe answer the question more comprehensively. Uh, hope that's okay. Um, I, I mean, we all love these discussions, but uh, time is a constraint, right? So let's just try to keep that in mind. All right, hope that's okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, thanks. So uh, our next team is securing and validating sensitive data and credentials. Do we have the folks here? Okay, awesome. Um, yes, yes. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. Hi. Um, so Hi, our, uh, yes, yes. So our uh, main solution was uh, like the problem statement is securing and validating sensitive data or credentials through the use of DLT or blockchain algorithm. So um, on, yes. So we're basically a team of four members. We're, we're from, we're studying in the university. We're in our third year. And yes, so this, why we pick this problem statement? So basically a lot of transactions have become online and uh, it actually has made our day-to-day -day lives much easier than going to a store and making transactions like going to the bank uh, uh, giving information about the other uh, person that we have to send money and doing all of that has become very easier through online payment. So we no longer need to venture outside and pay in cash. And uh, risks also decrease, uh, like uh, the risk increases when the amounts of transaction stored in a separate database, that is if it's stored in a centralized database. So 
it increases because there's there's loads and loads of data and it needs much uh, like uh, management so our main objective is to reduce the risk of potential like loss of data through hacking or any other forms of data loss like corruption data corruption or something like that and it's also to enhance storage options and make it affordable and easily available to customers so how we do this we will use uh, dlt to securely store our sensitive credentials like um, we provide a key like encryption we encrypt the data so basically how we do that is we break down all uh, the data that they like for uh, for instance if someone is storing their bank information so we basically encrypt the data we break it into chunks we encrypt the data so only you are able to access it and we provide a key so and distributes the files across the network so this is how basically a uh, blockchain works and so yeah so it's a decentralized technology meaning that your data is not stored in one database in one company so uh, suppose any database is attacked like if a company has its data breached so you don't need to worry about uh, losing that particular data and this is the architecture of hyperledger like why we chose hyperledger is because it has a consensus algorithm so this this is our main objective where people have to see what what you're storing like and everything that involves like uh, p2 person to person protocol and uh, distributed ledger ledger storage and all of this and these are all the participants in the blockchain so first we have the user to perform transactions then we have the certificate authority which basically looks through all of all of the certain questions required like whether they are they have licenses and all of that then we use a traditional database to access like to store the data then we use the processing platform like from where they access the data and everything and then uh, it's on a blockchain development network and the creator like the developer uh, makes the blockchain and then there's a network regulator like he takes care of all the uh, back end processes basically and uh, the benefits to this is it's it's a decentralized uh, like blockchain is a decentralized uh, solution where transparency is there but it also maintains confidential uh, like confidential data it doesn't uh, give out uh, data uh, like that and uh, it also improves security and denies uh, like you know malicious attacks and everything and you don't have to worry about anyone else having access to any of your data because you have the encryption key and it's your data at the end of the day and if and the data is accessed like you can access the data from anywhere it doesn't uh, need to be from your home system you can also access it anywhere uh, from anywhere so yes that is it so so where are you in your uh... the development process or testing or our option at this point in time please uh yes so uh, we haven't uh, built a working model so uh, we were we were trying to research into like because blockchain and uh, like decentralized storage is a very new concept we are trying to uh, learn more about it and we are uh, very like you know honored to be here because this is such a big platform and it gives us very much exposure towards this and uh, hopefully we will we will try to build it like uh, right now we are still at the learning stage um so yeah no wonderful and uh, have you so often times right a lot of these programs that we start to work on uh if you if we have an early adopter working with us hand in hand that would be great do you have uh 
your customers in mind whom you would be approaching as you start to build or you want to build and then go uh, approach your potential customers uh, i think if if we had like a prototype that would help the customers understand what we are trying to do and uh, we we would actually build the product first and then approach the customers got it okay yes, yes to what level uh, uh, you have done the market research for the uh, project yes sir so uh, there are uh, solutions for this like uh, decentralized storage that is available but uh, i've seen i've researched more and more uh, like uh, solutions based on this but i what i am trying to do is is making it uh, open source like uh, having a business model that properly fits uh, an everyday uh, customer instead of aiming for uh, large uh, companies like multinational companies okay thank you thank you very much so sincerely appreciate sharing your view and how you are attempting to uh, build this capability which is definitely required uh, best wishes to you and your team thank right. thank you sir um, so our next presenter is team sunyar i hope i'm pronouncing that right distributed charity platform uh, team you can start sharing Team Sonia, do we have you here? Good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sanat and Sayed Berman, Sanat Saman, Mortaza Iman. Right. Good evening. It's an honor to give us the opportunity of this presentation. I'm going to talk about distributed charity platform that is Sanyard. Uh, actually, this is our team members and our team courses as well. We we don't see this. Uh, the problem statement. Uh, we are not able to see your screen if you're sharing it. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're audible and visible, but your screen isn't. Uh, sorry, what's the problem? We cannot see your screen if you're sharing it. Excuse me. Oh, oh. That is... You can click on share screen on Zoom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Uh, about... okay? Is it okay? Yes. Uh, yeah, about our problem. Okay, uh, our problem state, statement based on statistics in 2021, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs of Iran said that about 70% of people in Iran are under the poverty rate. Uh, that means on the one side, we have a lot of needy in Iran. On the other side, there are a lot of uh, donors uh, in central charities. So uh, why these uh, donors and these uh, needy people are not connected to each other. Uh, the uh, problem is about uh, centralized charities. Uh, to say about their problems, unfair distribution uh, are one of them. Secondly, lack of possibility to evaluate NGOs, a lack of defining a unique identity for the needy in NGOs, lack of coordination in providing assistance for privacy. And uh, the last but not least, lack of trans transparency and money uh, laundering. And our proposed solution uh, is eventually we have designed a distributed ecosystem called Sanya, uh, which means a uh, distributed uh, plant uh, is uh, by a blockchain platform it is based on hyperledger fabric. Uh, Sanya is a distributed settlement platform which can be used by charity for managing donation process. 
we have uh, three phase, uh, three uh, phase here. POC phase is developing an open platform for charities. Uh, MVP phase uh, is designed and developed, uh, developed a distributed uh, platform for selling unique needy people and recording transparent and trackable transaction. We are, uh, we develop most of this phase. And the future uh, phase is develop a tokenized, tokenization process for making condition into digital assets for tracking them in the cloud. Uh, the proposed model aims to build a consensus uh, between charities based on five main processes that consist of uh, here. Uh, firstly, that's registration and ED. Uh, secondly, recording of benevolent projects or uh, plans, recording of aiding to the needy of any charity, uh, recording of aid between charities and the last one distributed settlement. Uh, here is our uh, diagram uh, that's uh, three section. Uh, our actually our uh, donors are connected to uh, are come to our system by a website. Uh, needy uh, actually uh, identified by any charity and registration their information and uh, organization that that are or charities uh, actually uh, are peer to peer to uh, organization or charities the network membership uh, they introduce and identify the needy cover for example, for example, settle assistant with the needy cover, settle assistant within the network. There are all jobs. About uh, market opportunity, actually, Sanya project is not defined to be a, a profit. It's a non-profit project. Uh, our uh, target or uh, the knowledge gained in the field of DLT and development of distributed settlement, the Sanya project can be effective in financial and banking markets. Uh, I mean, markets are or uh, market with uh, your, especially the Iranian banking market. Uh, we have five uh, use cases here. Uh, I will explain more in next slides. Uh, our novelty is uh, today about uh, Iranian banking has taken a step uh, toward transformation in the field of banking using distributed ledger technology or blockchain. But it is still new in this field. Uh, our distributed settlement in the near future can create a competitive advantage for banking in Iran and perhaps other countries in the region. Some of uh, use cases, uh, Post trade security clearing and settlement, for example, uh, is problem is expensive. Or by our solution, it can be reduced uh, from 50% up to 90% of trade processing and settlement can be automated. About another use case, cross border payments uh, is a slow settlement time. Our solution can make it possible for individuals and corporations to turn like more directly making payments simpler, faster, and more secure with settlement of cross-border payments. Another one is uh, interbank PVP settlement. It's uh, about its problem is control issue. By our solution, banks can net in an efficient manner choose what time to settle in which uh, currency and reduce settlement. Uh, let me show you a big I'm going to play a video. It's a real uh, situation of our transaction among blockchain network. Here uh, we have 87 blocks and 87 transactions. It's peer to peer. Actually, right now it's peer to peer. In organization two, organization two, we have sixteen transaction. Okay, we are going to uh, actually uh, like in 
in uh, our website is from organization to this uh, uh, website uh, is uh, one charity, for example. Here we are going to registration and needy. Uh, we put uh, some information about a needy here. Uh, in this, when we uh, when we wanna save this uh, transaction, it will go to the blockchain uh, network into a uh, fabric into a uh, hyperledger fabric. On the left uh, top. Uh, operation was uh, come back to our transaction here. Is 88 plus one plug and one transaction increase, and organization two increase to 17 transaction. Another uh, smart contract. Another is uh, defining a plan. We are going to define a plan. Information is. Uh, Added here. And after the save, uh, we see that the operation was successful. Another transaction uh, increased, in, increased, and organization to increase to 18, uh, 18 transactions. You see that uh, in the video we had actually, let me, here, uh, our transaction, uh, you can see IP uh, in here. Uh, and community ask, uh, our goals are to develop infrastructure improve system. We have a, we need a, a mentor and a special consultant in the field of DLT and also some conferences. Thank you. Thanks, uh, I finished. Uh, I finished my first. Sure. Thank you, uh, Judy. If thank you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to your team. Uh, can you reflect on where you are with the product? Because I, I saw something working, right? It's a prototype that's working. So can you elaborate the, the readiness towards having customers using this? Are you very close or you're halfway through? Can you elaborate that, please? Uh, actually, I say that it's not a, um, it's, it's a non-profit, uh, uh, actually, ecosystem for us. Uh, we are uh, related to uh, um, uh, bank mar banking markets, okay? Uh, we uh, simulated a settlement, a distributed settlement in our projects, and we are uh, some other use cases in banking, in settlement uh, for, for uh, developing settlement in realistic uh, banking markets, you know, banking projects. Uh, that's that's it. Uh, but we uh, negotiated with uh, some uh, organizations, some charities, to deploy this uh, ecosystem, and uh, that's uh, hopefully is, uh, they they are trying to um, uh, work with us. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, okay. And uh, so to what level uh, you can uh, practically implement the consensus in the system? To what yeah, level you can practically uh, implement uh, the consensus in the system? What do you think uh, are the challenges to, for implementing the consensus? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand. Uh, yeah, you have to uh, go for... Uh, some uh, consensus uh, between various parties over here, right? Okay, uh, we use yeah. a raft algorithm. Can you explain? Yeah. To what level implementation is possible? To what level its implementation is possible between these consensus parties? In and business, you mean? In market and business, you mean? 
Yes, yes, of course. Okay. He's not asking what consensus technically. Yeah. He's asking how do you onboard it. banks? Yeah, how do you convince banks to put those transactions here? Okay, because yeah. you're talking Absolutely. cross border, yeah, <laughs> cross border payments and all, right? And that is a Thank CBDC you. use case, and uh, we need not yeah. bring that. We can't really bring that kind of thing into a charity uh, scenarios, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. As we, uh, in reality, I believe that's reality. Yeah, I believe that it uh, it can be in reality because we have some several use cases here, and uh, uh, we uh, can implement this. Uh, uh, ecosystem in other projects, settlement is really important and uh, is uh, uh, distributed. It's really useful in other projects. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I think we can go ahead with the next presentation. Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, team. You can stop sharing your screen. So the next team that we have is transparency in the interoperability of the National Electronic Toll ETC network. Can you hear me? Right. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Um, okay. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, oh, okay. Well, well, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, well, our project is Transparency Interoperability uh, National Electronic Toll Network. This business, and this business for, for the Mexican government is very important because the incomes, the incomes every month, every week or every day are so, so, so high. So by this risk, but so, uh, by this reason, the problem statement right now we have is we, because there are a lot, a lot, uh, a lot of operator, a lot of operator around that, around that. But this operator, when you cross, the, when you cross the toll, when you cross the call, the, the, the toll, uh, you get the ETC message. This kind of ETC message is received by the toll. For example, the toll A, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have operator A, operator B. But in this case, for example, the tag owner, the tag owner toll, the tag owner toll pass across the operator B, but the owner is operator A. In this case, for example, this uh, you need to put this information into the FTP server. But right now, as you know, this protocol right now, the FTP server is so old, uh, is insecure right now. So by this reason, in this part of the, this part of phase, uh, we need to resolve three aspects, very important. So in this case, we need to resolve integrity, uh, traceability, uh, <clears throat> traceability and, and payment in this case, for example. Uh, but right now, uh, let me show you. Okay, the proposed solution we have right now is the first step is to take out the EFTP server. In this case, we propose, we propose, to, uh, we propose to have a, a solution uh, the blockchain, uh, the hybrid blockchain right now, using the hyperlayer and the hyperlayer public uh, process, okay, like a blockchain private or private blockchain, and to have right now the we have the need to, to use the NIR protocol. Uh, we thought to use the Ethereum protocol, but as you know, the Ethereum protocol uh, is suspensive the, 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 the first and uh, is so slow right now because they are using the proof of the proof of work. In this case, the NIR protocol is using right now the, the proof of stake. By this reason, uh, by, uh, what's this reason behind that to use the protocol uh, proof of stake? So uh, the, other, the other kind, the solution is to have, in this case, we need to, we need to that. We need to bring this information uh, to authority government. Up to now, the government does not have this kind of information when the operator give, the, give them this kind of information to make an e-invoice. 
In this case, in this case, in the invoice is so difficult to make us conceal because the government authority does not have this kind of information. By this reason, it's very important to have. It's very important to have in this case the hyperlayer fabric behind that because, as you know, uh, the blockchain or the pre blockchain is very important to this kind of business. In this case, and the government is very jealous with information, and by this reason, it's very important to have the hyperlayer and bring them. Uh, bring them this uh, this kind of administration because, as you know, uh, well, this kind of administration because as up to now they don't have they kind they don't have this information to make a conceal between the operator two operator two or three or four uh, just only just only receive the incomes and that's it. But after that they don't have to make a audit uh, with any information. The only information they they have right now is only the, the is only the operator one two or three. Or whatever any kind of operator have right now. So uh, this architecture right now is the the acts of the currently process we are making we, we are we are running right now into the into the the Talbot the ETC message. This propose we propose this architecture uh, as to, as you can see in this case for example we have the we we receive the ETC message about the Tall Eight for example. In this case, it is a message. It go into the blockchain first, and two go into the, the database. And after uh, the gateway, this one that we're gonna we're gonna send the it is a message into the queue the queue server, like uh, Rabbit and queue in this case. And after we're gonna send this information to the blockchain near or near blockchain, uh, because as you know, at the at the end of the month, we need to send this information. Uh, for example, summary. Information about this kind of this kind of ETC measures uh, pass around across the each tall uh, different owner. So um, the solution architecture is to make uh, is to make uh, is to put this in this architecture into the AWS right now. Uh, as you can see, we have the, we we have uh, EC2. I would like to I would like to put in this case in this case uh, three kind of on node. Uh, easy to right now to make a to make a conceal to make a simulate operator and after to simulate the send the message like a etc call so the solution architecture like a, a private blockchain fabric is this case is the architecture we need uh i was i was uh, we was thinking to we were thinking to have uh, operator five for example or operator two in this case uh, to receive the message uh, Okay, up to now we don't have any front, we don't have any front end, just only we have the we have the back end uh, underground process using the Python right now. And we send information across this kind of caching, and then we we send this information across the, the chain code. So as you can see in green, the authority, the authority admin is going to be the government. In this case, the government uh, is going to be the owner all the information after the operator send the e invoice to receive the incomes. So the architecture message queue, rabbit and queue, is, 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 is uh, this, this kind of architecture. We have the three, we have the three operator, for example, is gonna be is gonna receive the ETC message because as you know, uh, the gateway, this kind of process, the gateway is gonna receive every message, and the gateway is gonna think. Okay, I received this message, but you know uh, you are not the owner. You are not the owner. I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send this. Uh, this. Uh, process, this. Uh, it is a message to the correctly owner right now. In this case, the process is to receive the message, go to the exchange right now, uh, DHL for example, the message queue, and after I'm gonna send the uh, proper the, the proper the proper or the owner. In this case, operator one, operator two, operator three. In this case, in the uh, into the interoperability. We have the kind we have different operators. Uh, we thought this kind of operator has, for example, um, uh, Postgres is SQL. I don't know, but in this this simulate or this demo, we want to use a Postgres SQL. Uh, as, as you can see, we are using right now the Postgres SQL. The stack tech we're gonna use uh, is gonna into the AWS as CloudFront, EC2, Cognito, CodeBuild, for example, and database and Postgres and Web Engine. We, we are thinking about the we are the web page and uh, ORM we are using the SQLite and backend uh, in this case the TypeScript and front end Vue.js 
and CNC front end and GitHub and code files and private blockchain. We're going to use the hyperlayer. In public blockchain, we're going to use the, the near. And after, we're going to use the queue message server. We're going to use the rabbit and queue. So benefit about this, uh, behind the solution is the benefit of solution and so several. And the most important are the transparency and integrity information collecting from the cost operator. And if there, uh, for example, if there is a loose com communication, we're going to use the MQ server. But, but using the MQ server, we can, as, as you know, we are using the tolerance fail or fail tolerance. Uh, and after we guarantee the interoperability tag delivery, is uh, it's going to send the correctly message up to, uh, up to the correct owner in this case. So, okay, let me show you the demo. Okay, you can see my, my screen, right? We're still on the solution benefits slide and we have around 15 seconds left for before we open up for Julie. Okay, in this case, uh, we are, uh, I'm running right now the dockers behind that. In this case, this process is sending the information, the queue information uh, to the gateway. Right now, okay, uh, I wanna send the, the queue. So in this case, we have the different server, DHL, DHL is gonna, he gonna, he gonna receive the gateway infor information and the AQ server and the API gateway and maintainer uh, DB and after the web page, okay, is uh, under construct. Let me show you. Okay, the process is running right now. So uh, I'm going to start to receive the message right now. I'm running right now the gateway. So it's low. Okay, hope so. Let me run the cat, uh, Prometheus. Okay, right now, the process is running right now and sending right now, sending information to the blockchain hyperlayer. And we are, uh, we are uh, this process is sending right now the, the ETC message into the near protocol. So let me show you the, the application web or the web application. Okay, it's in here. Team, we're running really out of time. Would you mind wrapping it up if that's okay? Yeah. It's okay. We can understand. Uh, I mean, the stakeholders and all. Nothing much on the execution. It's okay. Well, up to now, we are we are receiving right now the 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 message from near, and near received the message. As you can see right now, we have in here the ETC message into the blockchain and local and local host right now because. I would like to use the, the public blockchain, but I'm using the, just only the local host to make a demo. And you can see I received the, this kind of message. Um, well, I would like to show you the Prometheus to check the, how, uh, how, can, how, how can I add the information into the hyperlayer fabric. So as you can see right now, we have the web page of RabbitMQ. Uh, RabbitMQ is receiving right now the, all the message. You can see it's receiving all the messages. And here we have the wallet near in local host and the fabric is receiving right now the, all the message 
into the blockchain, the private blockchain. Uh, excuse me for my for my laptop is so slow, <laughs> but okay. Uh, team, I'm really sorry, but I need to stop you at this point so that we can get at least one jury question in. We have about a minute or two left. Uh, so, uh, any questions, please? I, I just have one question. Uh, can you elaborate the importance of Hyperledger fabric here? So, a lot of the things you have explained is, is, is being built, right? So, there's some differentiation. If you can uh, share your view to the team, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Well, the, the important uh, to use the hyperlayer fabric behind that is to because, as you know, uh, well, we are using like uh, uh, you know, to, to resolve the transparency, uh, immutability, and the after the payment. But uh, you, uh, in this case, in, in Mexican government is very jealous or jealous with information or her, uh, his inf their information. Uh, in this case, hyperlayer fabric is gonna is gonna be good for us to share this kind of information and to be secure. To be secure, because uh, we thought to use, for example, uh, whatever engine, Oracle, or whatever you want, uh, you think. But hyperlayer is gonna is gonna be this one. The information etc message is gonna be safe to receive a, every invoice and to conceal information the different authority government. But suppose, suppose uh, it was the idea behind that. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? And I would like to know uh, why uh, he has uh, also have a combative statements with the other uh, platforms like uh, Ethereum for uh, implementation. That is uh, uh, concerns regarding the uh, proof of stake and uh, uh, making trans uh, TPS, et cetera. Uh, can you have a combative statement with other platforms? Well, uh, well, I, I don't have exactly uh, the answer to the TPS, right? So, well, we, we thought to use uh, we thought to use uh, the uh, near protocol because we are using I don't yes a different different kind of protocol and different levels of protocol two one three. So in this case, we're gonna use the level one. In this case, the proof of stake because it's gonna be more faster than more faster than Ethereum. And the other the other uh, the other uh, idea behind that is to use the because as you know the cost the cost or the uh, cost of the cost of transaction with Ethereum is more expensive than a near protocol right now. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, Ethereum is thinking to make uh, to move into the proof of stake, right? Now, but, but it's missing a lot, a lot of time. I don't know. But in this case, it's more faster. As you know, uh, okay. Uh, in this case, the government, the government can, uh, wants to resolve the micropayment. But in this phase, okay. Uh, in this demo, uh, I cannot show you the, the micropayment right now because it's not implemented. But near protocol is gonna is gonna is gonna support or it's gonna help you. To make uh, this this uh, to lower the cost. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, that concludes our presentations for the day. We saw a lot of really awesome presentations. Uh, thank you to the members of the jury for spending the time with us and um, helping us evaluate and uh, judging all the wonderful presentations. Thanks to all the teams for taking the time, you know, all these months to develop new things, awesome things and uh, presenting it here as well. Uh, do join in tomorrow. I think the invites have already gone out for it's, it. It starts at 11.30 a.m. IST. Uh, it may be in various different time zones for the rest of you. We'd love to see you there again. Over to you.